The India-UAE relationship, as you know, is an old one, which got a fresh impetus with Prime Minister Modi's visit to this region in 2015. What Mr. Modi set in motion is being followed up and furthered by the Indian Embassy here. And I'm happy to announce that His Excellency Mr. Navdeep Suri, India's ambassador to the UAE, is our guest of honor today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome His Excellency Ambassador Navdeep Suri on stage for his address. Mr. Navdeep Suri is India's ambassador to the UAE. A career diplomat, Mr. Suri has served India as the ambassador to Egypt and as the High Commissioner to Australia. A very good morning to everybody present, uh, in particular to my distinguished senior colleagues who've come from uh, Delhi. It's always a little intimidating to speak in their presence, especially when one of your mentors is sitting there. Uh, Ambassador Sibyl, a special welcome to you. The focus of this conference is on South Asia, and yet here we are in UAE, which is not quite South Asia. But then when we take a closer look at the map, we are only separated by a short stretch of water. It is our near neighborhood. It is only a three-hour flight from Abu Dhabi or Dubai to virtually all parts of India. It is only a three-day sailing from the west coast of India to uh, the Gulf. And those waters have traditionally defined our relationship. It was the monsoon winds that carried the traders from the Gulf to the Malabar coast and to Gujarat and Sindh. They spent time in those places buying spices, buying textiles and other materials and then waiting for the winds to ch change direction before they came back with their products to the Gulf. Those relationships meant that even today, in this city, you will find the older generation of people who speak some Malabari, who speak decent Urdu, who still sometimes call the dirham a rupee. Because till 1967, the rupee, the Indian rupee, was the legal tender in UAE, in Dubai, certainly. So to say that the relationship is an old one is a cliche. What's the new element in our ties? References have been made to the momentum given to the relationship since the Prime Minister's visit in August 2015, and that's a fact. References were made to the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Agreement that was signed. And that, too, is a fact. But then, is it just diplo-speak? Are we getting lost in our cliches that we've signed a great agreement and that's about it? Or is there really some substance to this strategic partnership? I'll try to break this down into a few elements so that we get a better sense of this relationship. Let me start with trade. Last year, our bilateral trade was $52 billion. That makes us UAE's largest trading partner. It makes UAE our third largest trading partner after China and the United States. With $32 billion of exports last year, it was our second largest export market after the US. A relationship in numbers that's much larger than our relationship with many of the G7 countries or G20 countries. When you move to investment, all you need to do is talk to Dubai Chamber of Commerce, visit the Jabal Ali Free Zone, go to Hamaria in Sharjah and see that anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of investments are by Indian entities. I cannot think of one major Indian company that doesn't have its Middle East headquarters here in Dubai. 150 flights a day connecting UAE with 17 different Indian cities, and still those flights are full, and still there's a demand for more. With 3.3 million Indians, the largest concentration of Indian nationals outside India, almost $15 billion in remittances last year, the largest source of remittances into India. You could say that these are some of the elements of that 
relationship or where we are moving the remarkable sight of seeing Mahatma Gandhi on Burj Khalifa on the 2nd of October as we launched our Gandhi at 150 celebrations. On 26 January this year, the equally remarkable sight of seven iconic buildings in Abu Dhabi being lit up with the Indian tricolor. An initiative of the government of uh, UA to say that this is a special relationship. The first ever Hindu temple coming up in Abu Dhabi. The Gandhi Zayed Digital Museum, which is going to be inaugurated next month. Or, more lately, the return of some wanted criminals from UAE to India. Each of those could be seen as elements of a new and emerging relationship. But we diplomats like to look at things a little bit differently. Sometimes we look at visits as a criteria. Prime Minister Modi has visited twice, making UAE one of the very few countries that he's gone to twice. And His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, has been to India twice, including, remarkably, as the chief guest on our Republic Day in 2017. Just last month, four senior UAE ministers visited India in the space of 30 days. And that, again, gives you a sense of how vibrant the relationship is when measured in terms of the high-level exchanges and the frequency of those. But to me personally, there are three or four specific areas where we are trying to add content to this strategic partnership. The first of these, in my mind, is the energy sector. Until as recently as two years back, we could say that it's a buyer-seller relationship. The UAE produces a lot of oil, we buy a lot of oil, and that's the end of the story. And yet, just in the last year and a half, we've had our first oil concessions in UAE in producing wells, and they guarantee us 1.5 million tons of oil per year for the next 40 years. We've set up our first strategic petroleum reserve in Mangalore with the partnership of ADNOC. And ADNOC is a strategic investor into our largest petrochemical and refining project in Ratnagiri, a $44 billion project in which a fourth of the investment and a fourth of the oil will come from ADNOC. And to me, that connection of their money and their oil coming into an Indian project is what is strategic. It's long-term. It connects the two economies in ways that were not seen previously. On the investment side, we are seeing much the same. The Abu Dhabi Investment Authority has invested many billions of dollars in the last two years into real estate, housing, infrastructure, highways, renewable energy, and are now looking seriously at creating a platform for investment into some of our non-performing assets and into the logistics sector. Mubadla, which is another sovereign fund, is similarly entering India in a big way, as are some of the champions of Dubai, DP Word, MR, and others. Each one of them looks at India as a major investment opportunity, and part of our task is to encourage that process. I spoke earlier about the large non-resident Indian community. I think one of the most significant developments in the last couple of years has been that as some of the Indian businesses have grown to scale, and as the competitiveness of the Indian economy has improved, many of them have started to invest in India. The Lulu Group alone, for example, has investments of over 10,000 crore rupees in India in sectors like hospitality and India's largest convention center and in the retail segment. BRS Ventures is another one getting into education and healthcare. I could go on, but there are a number of business groups from here who are today making very large investments into the Indian economy. And that, again, is a dimension that will keep growing. The third aspect is probably defense and security. And I know we have a number of experts here who five or 10 years back would have blanched at the idea that can there really be a defense and security cooperation between our two countries? And yet, uh, today, 
If you talk to our experts, they will say, this is probably one of the top five countries in the world in terms of our security cooperation. And areas that you read about and hear about, and in a number of areas that you do not hear or read about. And then the final point, I think, again, from a very diplomatic perspective, is the architecture that we are putting in place to sustain and nurture this relationship. We have a high-level task force on investment headed by our Commerce and Industry Minister and His Highness Sheikh Hamid bin Zayed, who is the Managing Director of Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. They meet every year and identify new areas and work on clearing roadblocks. We have a joint commission headed by our foreign ministers. We have a strategic dialogue which takes place every six months. That is headed by the Ministers of State for External Affairs. And there are a number of working groups that meet regularly, not for the sake of it, but actually to throw up tangible outcomes in areas ranging from space to railways to skill sector. And I think the skill sector is an interesting one because it usually doesn't come in the, uh, in the uh, diplomatic dialogue. But what we are trying to do is position India as a country that can meet UAE's requirement for skilled labor, even as the economy transitions from blue collar to increasingly white collar, where we take into account technology. And so we are working on a unique uh, skill mapping project with UAE, and there's a pilot project underway where 16 specific skills have been identified, and our training programs are being tweaked to meet the requirements of the UAE job market so that when these workers come with their, skill, uh, their certificates and diplomas, they are taken in as skilled workers. We are connecting our e-migrate portal with the UAE Ministry of Labor portal to make sure that our blue-collar workers who come here in such large numbers get much better protection within the framework of UAE's uh, labor laws. And interestingly, we are working on our first trilateral cooperation project where we combine UAE's financial resources and expertise in certain areas with our own uh, uh, human resource capacity. And the first of these was going to be an IT center for excellence that the two countries are setting up together in Ethiopia. I guess the reason I'm outlining these is that even though we are outside a South Asia context, we could perhaps see the template that is emerging between India and UAE for a relationship of what is possible, of goalposts that can be established, and then to see which part of this is replicable in a South Asian context. And so I hope that uh, uh, this conference in its deliberations today will take note of some of the unique dynamism that we are seeing in this particular relationship and see whether any of this can be applied elsewhere. Thank you very much.